Netflix nabs anti circuses Mowgli from Warner Bros. That is today's headline here on the Movie Burner News. And joining me as always is John. And first up, we're just going to talk about that headline. Uh, this is in regards to Netflix acquiring the rights to Andy Serkis' live action film Mowgli. We talked about this a long time ago on the Movie Burner podcast. Um, and they've acquired this from Warner Brothers for an undisclosed price and will be released sometime next year, John. Yes, I think we first spoke about this film, Stephen, when we did one of our profiles. In fact, it was the first profile we did, Stephen, on Andy Serkis on the very first episode of the Movie Burner podcast. I wouldn't advise you to go back and listen to that because that is very hard to listen to. <laughs> we were painfully, painfully bad at that point. We've, we've evolved, I hope. Um, but yeah, we first spoke about this film, then we became aware that there was a Mowgli film that had been made because this film has been made for a number of years now. I believe it was completed around about the same time that the Jungle Book, uh, obviously the John Favreau film, had been made. But for whatever reason, it was shelved. Well, we know why it was shelved, because they didn't want to have that conflict us putting out two different versions of the same story. And they certainly didn't want to compete with Disney's version, which was a fantastic film. I really enjoyed that Jungle Book film. This is totally different, though. It's a darker, more grittier interpretation of the classic story. And I'm not surprised that Netflix have bought this. I'm surprised that Warner Brothers have allowed them to buy it, though, Stephen, because I thought it looked like a very good film from the trailer which we also discussed much more recently. Uh, we'd seen the trailer, I think it was the first trailer, and it looked amazing. The, the CG looked good. The characters looked interesting. It's got an incredible cast. It's directed by the superb Andy Serkis, the king of mocap. So I'm very surprised Warner Brothers have released this from the grass, but I'm not surprised Netflix have bought it up. They can certainly be doing with more good films, Netflix. We were just talking about that before we came on, Stephen. Some of the films are atrociously bad, atrociously bad. We've got that one more recently from Forrest Whitaker. Um, I can't remember the name of it at the top of my head, but it's getting terrible reviews. There's been a whole host of rubbish films. There's been a whole host of good films. I've, I says recently, I don't know what show it was, that they do have a sort of a 50-50, 60-40 hit ratio. Um, maybe 40% or 50% are crap and the rest are reasonable to good. Uh, the Meyer Witch Story was a brilliant film. Annihilation was a brilliant film. That one with Idris Elba more recently was a good film. Uh, so they can release good films when they try. But more often than not, I think the good films are just from them going and shopping around uh, the festivals and picking out good films from the festivals and giving them distribution uh, deals. And that seems to be what they've done here. They've went to Warner Brothers. They've seen it's not getting a release until October. And they've told them, listen, we'll take that off your hands. We'll pay you the money. And then you don't need to worry about box office and stuff like that. We'll fire it out on our streaming service. But as you will probably come in and speak about, Stephen, they are doing a, some form of theatrical release as well. Hi, uh, John. I, um, I, I told you about this news the other day. And yeah. I think we both had the same reaction. We were very disappointed now. I was. But I think this is just the way we're conditioned. If it's not in the cinema, we see it, you know, it's, it's been a, a flop. And that may be changing. The times are a-changing, as they say. Yeah. And this may be the start of um, certain films being released this way. I'm glad it's going to be released cinematically. Um, I do believe that it's on the condition that it will be released as a 3D feature. Um, in selected theatres I think as well I think they've got to reach a quota as well if they want to be considered for Academy Awards as well so they've got to be released in so many cinemas throughout uh, the country yeah. uh, in the US that is and um, it's also uh, you know when you look at the cast of Benedict Cumberbatch playing uh, Shere Khan and uh, Chris and Bale playing Bagheera as well as well as obviously um, you know Circus playing Baloo it's such a big cast and it, it's a, it is a bit of a surprise, you know, that this is, uh, um, I'm, I don't mean handed over by Warner Bros. Certainly there's obviously a price involved in this, that, which is undisclosed at the moment. But this may be the start of um, things to come uh, with certain movies being released on um, the streaming services. Um, I think we're going to see it more when Disney finally release their uh, streaming service as well. I think we're going to get a lot of big major films um, that will be streamed on these platforms. How that will affect the cinematic releases, I'm not sure. It might be that it might be something similar to this, that the majority of these films will be in 3D, um, which I'm not too keen about. Um, certain films, I don't mind that in. Um, certainly Star Wars films, um, it works. Um, anything that's got heavy visual effects, 
it certainly works, but sometimes it can be a distraction as well. I think it'll work for this movie, though. I think this is going to be a lot of mocap. It certainly will be with um, Circus, you know, at the helm here. Um, especially when you're you're dealing with uh, these characters as well, very similar to the Jungle Book, mm. the John Favreau one that is, yeah. uh, which was released a few years ago. I felt that that was probably CGI at its peak at that point. Uh, it was an amazing looking film, and I think this one will be the same. It's going to be a darker film, of course. I'm looking forward to it, John. My initial reaction was, of course. Uh, a bit disappointed that it was going to be released on Netflix when I did find out they were going to have a cinematic release it kind of softened the blow a little for myself I, I can't speak for you but how, how did you feel when you first heard this news? I was disappointed Stephen I said that to you when you told me um, that was also a sign that there's something off with this film I don't know what certainly when you look at some of the articles people are saying when they watched the trailer that they felt something was off with the animation of the animals I didn't notice anything myself but it's always always going to be difficult for one of our others and this Mowgli film to compete with the Jungle Book release from 2016 because it was such an incredible film. The CG was groundbreaking. I didn't even realise it was all CG when I watched that film. And it, it was revealed that the whole film was uh, animated. Such was the realism in that film. So I find it very hard to believe that this film could ever compete. And there is always going to be that comparison there. It just, it's just going to happen because it's the same story albeit this one's a different take a darker take it's going to be compared to the Jungle Book story and I think even uh, Andy Serkis says that I read an article not the one I've got in front of me at the moment but he says that he was just relieved that it had been picked up by someone and it was going to get a distribution deal that the pressure was off him he obviously felt the same as what I'm saying that there was going to be comparisons and it was never ever going to compete with the nigh on one billion dollar total grossing that uh, the Jungle Book had in its release, it was never going to get near that. I don't think it would have anywhere reckoning at best five, six hundred million if it really hit with people. But as I said, this is just Netflix trying to build the collection of films, their original releases, they're going around shopping the likes of Cannes and Toronto, looking for good films that have not picked up distribution deals yet. When we spoke about the Cannes Film Festival being at war with Netflix, I touched upon that at that point, that they do like to go around these festivals and pick up interesting films. Certainly they've not went to a festival here, they've just went straight to, to Warner Brothers and picked it up. But it does beg the question, have Warner Brothers been touting this film about? Because certainly there's no smoke without fire in regards to that. They've not just went to Warner Brothers and says, listen, if you get any films on you that I would like, that you'd maybe want to give us for a price... I can't imagine Netflix phoning Warner Brothers and the other studios up and saying, can we take any of your films? They must have been touting this film about... And it would point, I says that to you as well, Stephen, when you told me, it would point to there maybe being something wrong with it. I don't know what. Because when you look at the cast, it's incredible. Kate Blanchett, Christian Bale, Benedict Cumberbatch, Andy Serkis. It's an incredible cast. But there must be something wrong with it. That's the only thing I can think of for what the likes of Warner Brothers to be giving up what would otherwise be a very interesting film with potential to do well at the box office. I can't really add much more. I don't know why they've done it. But I will watch this film when it pops up on Netflix, whenever that may be. I think they're saying that it will retain its original October 19th cinematic release, though. And as you did say, I know they're saying next next year it'll be on the streaming service, so it'll be next year, but the, the cinematic release will be in October, as promised by Warner Brothers. I did say that Circus hinted that it would be the 3D version that would get the cinematic release, um, because he found it interesting that it was a totally different take on the film, and that he thought it was worthy of going out to theatre. So I think that'll be the one that'll go out in the 2D version will come on to Netflix later next year. But listen, as I say, every cloud has a silver lining, Stephen, and I'm sure this film will find its natural place. If it's good, people will watch it, and I'm sure it will get some recognition come award season. If it's decent enough, if it's not, if it's a pile of crap, it will get flung into the second hand bin and <laughs> forgotten forever. It does sound like Warner Brothers are dropping this film for its yeah. low quality, though, John. It's, it does reek, it, reek of that, you know. And the other thing, um, I'd hate to think this is the road we're going down mm. where um, you know studios are going to release 2D versions on streaming services and you know are we going to be overpopulated with 3D films you know in the cinema um, I, I certainly hope not because as I said previously you know certain films are a joy to watch in 3D but it's a novelty factor yeah. it's something that's um, I think starting to die down now and I think the novelty factor is wearing off with a lot of people uh, they're, they're opting more for the traditional 2D experience now but it remains to be seen you know um, I th- it's a film I was looking forward to seeing 
Um, I still will go and see this. Um, you know, it's got Andy Serkis's name all over it. He's directing it. He's starring in it. The man does not put a foot wrong. I should say, hardly ever puts a foot wrong uh, with his um, directorial films and films in general that he released. And certainly, you know, it's his company uh, is obviously creating these uh, motion captures uh, for these characters. And he's not failed as yet. So I don't think, it, I don't know, it does reek that this, that the studio perhaps get a little bit less faith in it. Yeah, the final thing I'll add, Stephen, is I do recall reading an article when we were discussing this the last time that says that the likes of Benedict Cumberbatch were getting right into character on the set, yeah. <laughs> literally playing the animals. So that may account for why the animation was a little bit wonky. Certainly one thing's for sure, you'll not have horrendous animation if Circus' no. mocap company was no. involved. It'll probably be down to the animators themselves putting it on the screen that have made an arse of it if it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, listen, there'll be more news coming out of this yeah. between now and probably October, that um, initial release date anyway, John, so we'll just have to stay tuned. But this is a, this is something that came on, it was an article on Collider.com yeah. in regards to um, a new clip from this new animated film from DC, The Death of Superman. Yeah. And we both watched the clip, John. Um, it's basically just doomsday attacking some town. I know that you've not sat down and, and watched any DC animated films yet. I'm sort of probably a third the way through uh, watching these. They're very hard to come by, some of them. I'm still struggling to get them. What I do want to do is watch them in chronological order of the release. So it's kind of held me back um, a little bit, try to get my hands on some of them. This animated movie is on digital starting from uh, July 24th and will be on Ultra HD Blu-ray as a combo pack on Blu-ray and a combo pack and DVD on August 7th. So it's, it's still a, a good week or so away before the, the Blu-ray release. But I, I don't think I'm going to begin out to get this one right away just because it's I've got so much to watch before I, I get to this point. But one thing I will say is, and you picked up on this as well, uh, someone who's coming in to... St- seen this as uh, with fresh eyes John yeah. um, you were quite impressed by the animation I was, I was indeed it looked very slick, it looked very cool the Doomsday character looked very cool as well, a big towering imposing figure, just totally tearing it up, he appears out of the sky and then these coppers all slide up and start shooting at him, they blow up a gas tank next to a gas station, or a petrol station if you're in the United Kingdom and they think they've got him, but it's much like uh, I believe Terminator 2 when Robert Patrick's T-1000 walks out of the fire, he was not killed. He goes right up into the sky and comes right down and I presume wipes him out. We don't see that in the trailer, but it's very intriguing, <coughs> Stephen. As you say, I've not watched any of the DC animated films. Certainly very interested from the reviews you have done of the various ones you've watched. Some of the ones that have intrigued me the most, most notably being uh, Gotham by Gaslight. Just interesting concepts where they go back in time and they, they do fresh takes on the, the classic superhero tales. And obviously this is just all the classic comic book stories as well that you've got 50 and 60 years of uh, that you can go back in mind for animated films. And much of these animated films do inspire the live action films that we see coming into the likes of the DCEU and also the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, so I would probably give this a watch at some point. I would go back and do what you're doing though. Watch them all chronologically. I'll watch the, the more prominent ones before giving it a, a bash. But the synopsis is very interesting as well. The Man of Steel meets his ultimate match when Doomsday comes to Earth, hell-bent on destroying everything and everyone in his path, including the Justice League. An all-new, action-packed The Death of Superman, part of the popular DC Universe and movies. So I presume the Justice League will be in there as well. And as you've seen them, Stephen, you've seen... This is the proper Justice League. This isn't the likes of Cyborg and some off that they're flinging in. This is all the, the great characters from the comics getting flung in here. Uh, but... Love that poster as well. We spoke about that poster, Stephen. Very, very cool. Looks like it's been utter hell and carnage unleashed upon a city there. It looks like something out of Terminator again from the future. You've got the flag of Superman ripped and billowing in the wind. So I'd probably give us a bash at some point. Just from the trailer, it intrigued me and it's intrigued me to go in and dip my toe in all these other DC animated films. And it all kicked off from 2007 with the Superman Doomsday film as well. So there's a nice tie-in there. That was the Adam Baldwin one. And that's what really kick-started, um, you know, my love for these uh, films. I, I just think they're so fascinating that they use different directors, different animators, and um, they've got all this material to work from as well, um, which transcends well from the comic book. Um, a lot of it stayed true to the 
to the original sources and also as well it kind of inspires a lot of the the new live action stuff that's coming out now you know when i watched the the wonder woman film uh, from i think 2008 2009 the one that was just released last year or two years ago is a carbon copy of it but you can see where they took the elements from um certainly you know in the in regards to patty jenkins she basically had the storyboard there um and that's not a dig towards the director she did a fantastic job in that film and basically she kept the the dc eu uh, afloat with that film uh, yeah. after the disappointing batman v superman um this film it's um it's directed by a chap called jake castorena i'm not familiar with but uh, just looking at the cast when you've got the likes of uh, jerry o'connell he's going to be playing superman got Rain Wilson in there playing Lex Luthor, that was going to be very interesting. Rosario Dawson, who's no stranger to the comic book genre just now in the um, yeah the Marvel television series at the moment. She's uh, she's in the Daredevil series, uh, Luke Cage and, and um, Iron Fist, etc. It's just it's fascinating to see this cast being put together. Um, a few of them have done animated films before, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing this. This one looks of very high quality. In regards to its um, animation storytelling, I think Peter Tomasi is one of the writers on this. Um, remains to be seen, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, but as I said, I don't think I'm going to rush out to get this one because I've got such a back catalogue to get through before I get to this one. Yeah, the final thing I'll add, Stephen, is that it does allow these writers and the directors they've got more freedom to do what they want in these animated films than you would have to in the the live action films. They can explore a whole host of characters and do things that are a little bit more wacky that you wouldn't get away with in a live action film so it allows them the trial and error and then a live action director can come along and pinch some of the better ideas much like what they did with Clone Wars and Star Wars but we're going to move on to the next topic this one is all about Peter Dinklage starring in the new Rumpelstiltskin movie which is going to be produced by Sony Pictures Chaos walking off of Patrick Ness is attached to write the adaptation of the Brothers Grimm fairy tale and Peter Dinklage I believe is set to star alongside Felicity Jones and it's directed by a certain J.A.B. Warner who has dipped his toes into the waters of uh, blockbuster releases with Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom this year and he's doing it again um, um, I think there was a Rumpelstiltskin movie a few years ago wasn't oh, it John? Yeah, was it an animated one, an animated yeah. one yeah yeah, I mean, this anyone that's not familiar with the the story, it's it's based on the Brothers Grimm fairy tale about a girl who is tasked with spinning straw into gold for an evil king that threatens execution. Unable to do so, she makes a deal with an imp, Rumpelstiltskin, that she comes to regret. Uh, this film is going to be produced by Karen Rosefeld, Circle of Confusions, Matt Smith, and David Alpert, David Ginsberg, and Josh Weinstock. Um, there's not much more to say on this other than obviously the announcement that Peter Dinklage is going to be um, portraying a, a character yeah. in this movie. It doesn't say actually what character he's going to be playing. Um, you presume it would be Rumpelstiltskin, wouldn't you? Because uh, he, he is an imp. Yeah, exactly. He's a smaller character. Yeah. I don't want to say yeah. Peter Dinklage is an imp here, but he's a smaller man yeah. and he's going to play the smaller character. And as we said, Stephen, before we came on, he did play the antagonist in Day of Future Past, I believe. And this. The, Rumpelstiltskin is clearly the antagonist in that story, so it's a guy who's well versed with playing an antagonist, and I think he'd do a great job in this. Starting alongside Felicity Jones as well, she's a fantastic actress. I don't know whether this is a live action film or a, an animated take on it again. I wouldn't imagine it would be an animated take. With there being an animated film from two years ago, I would imagine they'd be doing this whole live action thing they've continued to do with various different stories. They've adapted, obviously, Beauty and the Beast, The Jungle Book, mm-hmm. they're doing The Lion King, John Favreau again. So I'd imagine it would be along those lines. Um, in terms of uh, the writer, Patrick Ness, was, this was a chap that wrote the book A Monster's Call, which was also adapted into a film um, a couple of years ago as well. That was a fantastic film, incidentally. So if he's involved with that story, in terms of pen in the book, then it bodes very well for the adaptation of this story. Uh, as she says, we don't know much more about it. We know the director, we know the producers... I thoroughly enjoyed J.A. Biona's take of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom getting into that universe. Also, he didn't pen the story, but he's not penning the story here either. They took the reins from Colin Trevero, who had to go off and unsuccessfully try his hand at writing and directing a Star Wars film. Done a great job. That's my favourite take of a Jurassic Park film since the original, so I'm comfortable with this guy helming this. And certainly the two leading actors they've got in bodes very well too, so I can't wait to see more information, can't wait to see more announcements for the cast. 
Yeah, one thing um, that did surprise me, it shouldn't really, John, is that Dinklage is um, assuming that he is going to be playing the, the title role here, yeah. is that he is going to be the, the, the lead in this film. Yeah. Um, something I don't really see a lot of him doing in these uh, past films. We were just talking before we came on. He's such a presence in any film. It yeah. uh, doesn't matter how great or small the, the role is. When you look at films like Infinity War, uh, he played his part in that. Very memorable scenes, um, you know, when he had his screen time with Chris Hemsworth. And um, again, in Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, he's just one of those memorable characters. A very funny man as well. Um, and as you mentioned, Days of Future Past, playing uh, Trask, um, the, the, the villain of the movie. Um, he's, he's just a great actor, you know, and... He really brings life to these characters as well. And he's so versatile as well. Um, this is one of these guys that just can put his hand to anything. Um, anything he's in, I will watch. Yeah, and the final thing I'll add, because I'm adding a lot of final things in this show, Stephen, is that I'm so glad to see that he's preparing for a future outside of Game of Thrones. This is going to be after Game of Thrones ends. It kind of puts me in mind of uh, the whole Harry Potter cast. And this is a decade-long thing that he's been connected with. But much like them, he's really worked hard at trying not to be typecasted. Some of them have been successful at that, some have not so successful. Um, but I'm glad to see he's trying to do something different outside of the whole Game of Thrones thing. He's, he's been incredible as Tyrion Lannister. Also, he won two Emmys and a Golden Globe for that character. He's an incredibly talented chap. I can't wait to see what he does here. Uh, just moving on, John. This is just uh, it's just a little bit of brief news here in regards to... Th- this doesn't really affect us guys here in the UK. It's more our... Uh, US friends in regards to their movie passes. This was uh, something that was picked up on IndieWire in regards to the current state of uh, this company, Movie Pass. I think it's very similar to what we've got over here. Well, it's not very similar, in fact. We, we've actually got a very good deal over here with uh, the unlimited passes that we have. Yeah. This uh, Movie Pass um, company, um, the headline says that they can't afford the movie tickets and they've received a $5 million emergency loan to resume services. Now, we, we had a look at the, the article. It seems to be in a bit of a mess at the moment. Yeah. A lot of um, the... The customers uh, were having a lot of problems with their cards the other night, um, a lot of uh, interactions on Twitter, etc., with a lot of unhappy customers who were getting told that uh, there was a few technical issues um, with the service. Um, it digs a lot more deeper into perhaps what could be an underlining uh, threat to them, you know, the company's future. Yeah, I'm not too surprised by this but now, Stephen, at all. I mean, I've been kind of following this story on off uh, for a, a little while now, uh, most notably on John Campia's daily show. He's spoken about this umpteen times in the past and he says that it's been too good to be true, this. The way they've been promoting this service, um, obviously charging customers $10 a month, I believe, to have unlimited amounts of viewings at cinemas. The tickets charge double, the tickets cost double that, I believe, and somewhere like LA it could be up to $20 for a ticket if not more so the maths didn't add up and he was very suspicious as to how they were making their money I think what he established was that they were trying to use their large customer base that they'd accrued to fling their weight about and try and force the cinemas or the theatre companies into giving them a portion or percentage of their profit out of obviously grossings weekly grossings of films and the theatres didn't actually back down to them, they told them to get lost. And this is also the result of them uh, struggling to pay for tickets, having to get a $5 million emergency loan. You'd imagine now that they'll have to either up the prices or limit the amount of viewings customers can get per month. I know there's a rival service, Cinemere, over there, which is much more like what we get over here. It's slightly more expensive and there is limits on it. We don't have a huge amount of limits though over here. It's £17.90 odds for a Cinema World Unlimited card and you can go as many times as you want there's no limits on films you can watch you can watch say Fallen Kingdom once and you can go and watch it the next day you can watch it twice in a day it's quite a good service we've got over here slightly more expensive, I think that would work out at more than like $30 a month but you've not got this nonsense where you've got companies trying to bail themselves out with $5 million loans this is the cinemas themselves that provide it over here not third party companies it's a dodgy service and I'm glad to see they're getting the comeuppance for trying to force cinemas and theatres into giving them a percentage of their profits, which they were in no position to make demands like that in the first place anyway. Another thing that surprised me, John, was, you know, these um, conditions mm-hmm. 
that they tried or they did, you know, enforce onto the customer. This is something, this is really bad business. Uh, when you look at it, the, the surge in pricing and eliminating customers from seeing the same film twice. Yeah. Um, I do believe that I might have picked that up on one of uh, John Kempe's shows as well. Mm-hmm. Um, because as I said, you know, we don't have this company over here dealing with, um, you know, the, the membership of the, the paying customer for the cinemas anyway. So you're totally screwing over your customers at this point. Then it's, it's just not looking good for this company at all. I don't know too much more about it, to be honest with you, John, but um, just reading that article, yeah. and this didn't come as a surprise. As yeah. I said, you know, we've been getting sort of droplets on social media in regards to the situation over in the US, in regards to Movie Pass, and it's not looking good for them at all. Um, I'm just thankful what we've got over here with the Unlimited Passes. Uh, you and I uh, frequent the Cineworlds, yeah. um, and it's a, it's a great um, service. I think we get more than our money's worth um, for our monthly subscriptions. Uh, we don't seem to have the same sort of restrictions as our US counterparts as well. No, we don't. And uh, listen, we were talking about this a couple of months back, Stephen, the movie pass service. We wished it was, it was over here because it sounded like a great deal. It's too good to be true, really. Mm. And it has been. Most things that look too good to be true are usually a con of some kind. It does say in this article that they are, or they were, burning through $20 million a month with only $15.5 million cash on hand. So the numbers didn't add up. They couldn't stem the weeding. The company said to institute the policies that you mentioned previously. This mob that they have got the loan off of can demand more than $3 million back by the 1st of August and the rest by the 5th of August. So they've not got very long to try and sort this problem out. I don't think they'll sort it out unless they perform a miracle and they just completely shake up the way they're offering films to these customers. I think most of the customers will now bail out because it's too dodgy and they don't want to lose... Uh, any benefits they'll probably go to Cinemia now who by all accounts offer a much better service and it's not a dodgy con of a service but we're going to move on Stephen and it's uh, all about (coughs) Shazam one of the strangest characters in the DC universe it's a brief history of the character for those like us who don't know much about this bizarre character who's had umpteen aliases and a very troubled history yeah John uh, we were talking about this a few weeks ago I think it was uh, maybe two or three weeks ago before we saw the trailer last week um, that was released at Comic Con and it was interesting reading um, and I knew of a Captain Marvel character um, via actually a Beatles song from the 1960s the late 1960s and it's reference uh, and it's not the the Brie Larson Captain Marvel this is actually um, the origins of Shazam who was originally called Captain Marvel Um, there was a lot of uh, confusion over the the ownership of this at some point I think the the likeness uh, of the original Captain Marvel from a company called Fawcett Publications whose uh, character reeked of uh, the, the image of Superman and were threatened to be sued over this likeness and um, I'll just give you a, a little brief history on this, John. Uh, I don't really want to get into great details for people who are already aware of this, but for certainly people like ourselves that are not familiar with the character, and we're very impressed with that first trailer. It basically just says, uh, who is Shazam? This is from movienews.biz. It's a great article. You should visit this site. And it's, um, who is Shazam? And where do we even begin? If we start at the very beginning, Shazam also known as Billy Batson, was created by Bill Parker and C.C. Beck in 1940 for a small-time publisher known as Fawcett Publications, as I've just previously mentioned. And basically, Fawcett, uh, they were wanting a superhero on par with the National Comics, which would later become DC Comics' most popular character. That is obviously the character of Superman. And um, uh, Captain Thunder was born. But by the second issue, Fawcett wanted more panache, so Captain Marvel was born. The one that shouts Shazam to activate his magic powers. And Captain Marvel ran from 1940 to 1953 in some capacity at Fawcett Publications. During those years, Fawcett wrangled with National Comics who sued them for copyright infringement because Billy Batson's alter ego looked an awful lot like Superman. And for some weird reason, the trial in 1951 absolved Fawcett of criminal activity, but the company still shuttered two years later after an appeal by National Comics found that some of Fawcett's storylines were in violation of copyright. And lo and behold, they forgot to renew their copyright and Captain Marvel's name fell into the public domain, where it was scooped up by DC Comics' new competitor Marvel Comics. 
So the bottom line was that um, this character existed, but they couldn't use the name. And um, Shazam was born. It's a very interesting read. I don't want to, obviously, read the whole article out. Go over to movienews.biz and read this article. It really does go in-depth. Uh, the ins and outs of this character, how it's created, uh, its origins. And it's just a fantastic read. Um, it's something I wasn't very knowledgeable about. Um, I know a bit more about it now, certainly after that trailer, John, uh, from last week. It really did intrigue me to find out more about the the character and movienews.biz certainly did cover that. Yeah, I didn't know about the troubled history. I did realise that there was two Captain Marvels. I recall you telling me about that, Stephen. And also they zapped him right in the eye line from uh, the continuing story of Bungalow Bill from the Beatles all the way back in 1966. Referenced that Captain Marvel. I always assumed it was the Marvel Captain Marvel, but hey, I was wrong. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's an intriguing history. Obviously, legal troubles and as they do say in that article, it was a cutthroat business back in the 1940s and 50s. You had a lot of plagiarism, um, small-time publications trying to steal bigger publications' characters, steal ideas and foster them off as their own. Um, but it goes on to great depth, Stephen. It talks all about how he, the manner in which he got his powers and stuff like that, how it was granted by various different deities such as Solomon, Hercules, Atlas, Zeus, Achilles and Mercury. talks about the, the moral ambiguity of... Uh, gifting a child the ultimate power and how it, this ancient wizard or deity seeked out pure humans and it talks about Black Adam being a, a pissed off ancient Egyptian demigod and that it was more complicated than that. It just gives you a great insight into the actual character's publication history, insight into the legal history of him, how the name changed from Fawcett DC's publications into Marvel's publication. It's just it's a fantastic article looking at a very mysterious and interesting character. Certainly one I didn't know anything about, much like Black Panther and until around its release. Uh, there's a whole history of fascinating characters like this just littered throughout the past in comic book publications and I, I thoroughly enjoyed the reading. I'd highly urge anybody else interested in this character before the film comes out to give it a bash and arm themselves with knowledge. Unless, of course, you're a big fan of comic books, in which case you won't need it. Yeah, one thing I predict in John is that 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 suit that he's wearing, yeah. um, by the time that he intermingles with the likes of the Man of Steel and the Dark Knight, that suit's going to change. I yeah. think it's going to become a more serious looking suit, very much like um, the way that Spider Man suits evolved over, yeah. you know, Homecoming or, or before that even as well in, in uh, Civil War, uh, Homecoming, and then Infinity War, we see this new sort of Iron Man Spider suit. Um, I think it's going to be something similar to this suit. I think this is going to suit this film um, and its uh, tone. But I think by the time that this character's uh, intermingling with the, the rest of the DCEU, that suit is going to change. I think it's going to be looking less comic book, if, if you pardon the pun. Yeah, yeah I've not got much more to add, Stephen. It's a fantastic article. I'd highly urge anybody that's interested in the character to go and give it a read if you don't know much about it like we do. Certainly there's big fans of comic books in general who don't even know a lot about this character because he's a very obscure character, just like Black Panther was. Um, but we're going to move on to the final topic in this week's episode of Movie Burner News and it's a very concerning topic indeed, Stephen. It's all stemming into Hollywood's utter fascination with remaking classic films and the one that they're planning to remake this time is the 1973 classic Bruce Lee film Enter the Dragon I know you will not be happy about this Stephen you're a big fan of Bruce Lee I'm a big fan as well but you are an even bigger fan and this is blasphemy yeah uh, ironically being his last complete film John this was the first Bruce Lee film I saw <laughs> uh, with my grandmother in the early 80s I absolutely loved it I've lost track of the times I've seen this movie one of the things um, that really peed me off about this article, it's coming in from Digital Spy, who went to great lengths to announce this movie remake. And according to Deadline, Deadpool 2 director David Leitch is going to be in discussions to be at the helm of this movie. The, David Leitch is a fantastic director. Yeah. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed his work on Deadpool 2 and certainly the John Wick franchise as well. The guy is a very talented actor. I'm not um, decrying any of his work. Um, the fact that he's actually directing two of the biggest properties at the moment in Hollywood um, baffles me why he would want to touch this. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that I'm annoyed is that Enter the Dragon is one of those films, like Back to the Future, um, should not be remade. There's no reason for this other than to make money. 
uh, to be remade. I, I, I seem to recall that there was some um, remake of the Game of Death movie um, in some kind of form, and I wasn't too fussed about that because the the actual cinematic release of that movie was a bit of a shambles anyway. Um, Bruce Lee had only... Um, filmed those fighting scenes with that yellow cat suit on um, and the rest was all built uh, around those scenes and it was a bit of a monstrosity. This, on the other hand, is a film, um, it was Bruce Lee's final film. He sadly didn't get to see its premiere. He died only weeks before its release. He didn't get to see his um, big Hollywood moment. It's very sad, you know, looking back on uh, the man's career. But what I will say is that Enter the Dragon was never the greatest story ever written. Um, it was a very simple story. People who have watched this film and went back to see this film don't really go back to see it because of its story. They go back to see it because of Bruce Lee's charisma yeah. and his fighting style. And when you look at the other films, such as Fist of Fury, like The Game of Death, like I mentioned, The Big Boss, The Way of the Dragon as well, these films were, were good films for their day, very low quality um, very limited budget as well. I think it was Golden Harvest that produced these films. This was his big break. This was going to be the big entrance, if you like. I think that's why the title was called Enter the Dragon, because this was going to be his big break into Hollywood yeah. and to a widespread audience as well. And sadly, he'd never got to see that day. And it's just... Uh, that's the only reason that people go back to see this movie, because it's Bruce Lee in it. I just can't see the attraction in a remake of this. I don't care who they put in it. I mean, they can put Donnie Yen in this and I still wouldn't be that bothered. And I'm a big Donnie Yen fan. Um, I just don't see the attraction to this other than trying to make money. Yeah, I can't really add much more to what you said, Stephen. You're the Bruce Lee enthusiast in here. And I completely agree. You cannot match the man's charisma. Um, the people who have been commenting on this and really been outraged by it, are, they're absolutely bang on. Uh, this is the one movie you can't touch because it, it wasn't about the story, as you said, Stephen. It's about the charisma of the man. Even that one, saying it from John to you, I don't know how you pronounce that name, but he says that if you you can't add anything new, exciting or delicious to the dish, then leave it alone. He says that remakes are a lot like fusion food. So that's what the context of that last comment was, and he's completely right. You can't get a better ingredient than Bruce Lee. You're not going to match the man for his athleticism, his ability, the way he weaved around, and his slickness of a man. I can't imagine watching an Enter the Dragon film and not having any connection to Bruce Lee. It's all about that man. And I don't care what director you get in, you can get in David Leitch. I thoroughly enjoyed David David Leitch's direction in various films. He was brilliant in Deadpool 2. John Wick. I enjoyed his panel at Comic Con, where he did go into depth about how he picks actors for his films, that he was inspired by a comment James Mangle told him that he picked the man. Um, someone who, who can embody their own stuff like that, but he's not going to get anyone to embody this role better than Bruce Lee. As you say, it's Donnie Yen, doesn't matter who you get in, it's not going to work. And even that comment someone else who says, director Justin Lin has, only has an entire blog and YouTube channel inspired by Bruce Lee. Why would you not get someone like that in if you're planning on making a remake? I don't want a remake. I don't want to see a modern take on this classic film. It's like Star Wars for me. It's like Back to the Future, as you said. You can't better it. It's sacred to me, it's sacrilege, it's blasphemy. Shouldn't be done. Leave it well alone. <laughs> this is the man's last film, and it, it's never going to be tainted by utter shit like this, so I don't want to see it, and that's the end of it. I've not got much more to add to that. It was a short and sweet little topic, because I'm just we had to get that out of our systems there. Um, it's, no, not for me, sorry. And that just wraps up this episode of Movie Burner News. We'd just like to thank you once again for joining us, and we'll be back to do it all again next week. Remember guys, if you enjoyed that latest episode, then do hit the like button, comment below and maybe even subscribe to our channel if you haven't done already. If you want to follow us on social media for all the latest updates from Movie Burner Entertainment, then we can be found on Twitter and Facebook at Movie Burners. You can also listen to us on Google Play and iTunes if that's more your thing at the Movie Burner Podcast. And last but not least, if you want to access all the latest written reviews and the occasional article that we put out, then that can be found on our website at movieburnerentertainment.org. Until next time, Goodbye.